Continental drift explains how the continents have been shifting throughout different geological eras. The world we know today looks a certain way, but almost 200 million years ago, it looked very, very different. Today, you're gonna go on a journey to understand continental drift by learning about all of the evidence that led to the discovery of the continent's movement. So prepare yourself and turn on your neurons because we're starting an amazing journey to learn the story of Earth's continents. Actually, if you just look at the shapes of the continents, some of them suspiciously seem to fit together. But in science, suspicions are not enough. Hypotheses must be justified and demonstrated. It was a scientist named Alfred Wegener who did just that. To understand how Wegener arrived at his conclusions, we must first understand the era that he lived in. Wegener obtained his doctorate in 1905. Traditionally, at that time, it had been assumed that, according to the Bible, the Earth was about 6,000 years old. Many scientists also defended that the Earth had remained geologically and biologically identical since the creation. After all, in 6,000 years, there wasn't really enough time for animals to change or for the geology to significantly modify the planet. However, James Hutton had proposed the rock cycle in the late 18th century, and for the cycle to work, the Earth had to be at least hundreds of millions of years old. And during the 19th century, Darwin also postulated the theory of evolution, which also required hundreds of millions of years in order for species to evolve. So by the 20th century, when Wegener was studying, almost all scientists accepted that the Earth was actually very old, and therefore it could have changed significantly since its origins. There already had been some scientists who proposed that, in the past, South America and Africa may have formed a single continent. But many others did not find it logical. Continents, like the ocean floor, are huge sections of rigid rock. And if the rock is rigid, it can't move. So there was no way to explain this kind of movement. Wegener published the possibility that the continents had been a single supercontinent in the past. He justified his idea by pointing to the remarkable similarities between the coastlines of South America and Africa. However, Wegener's idea was not taken seriously. The continents didn't fit together perfectly, so he faced a lot of criticism for it. He was also told that the coastline is constantly being modified by the erosive action of the sea. So even if it was true that the continents had been together in the past, the sea would have modified the coastline so much that they wouldn't fit together again. So a disillusioned Wegener began to think that perhaps he was wrong. Until, that is, he found a scientific article written by a biologist explaining that identical fossil species have been found in both South America and Africa. So, there should have existed some kind of land connection so they could move from one place to the other. Wegener began reading all the scientific articles he could find and was surprised to discover the crazy ideas that some scholars proposed to justify how species could have traveled from one continent to the other. It was proposed by some that animals had simply swam across the entire ocean. This is something that could be true for some land species, like wild boars. For example, it had been proved that they can cross the less than 20 kilometer wide Strait of Gibraltar. But swimming thousands of kilometers? That didn't sound plausible. Others suggested that animals had arrived on floating logs. While this could happen in small distances, they would eventually die of hunger and thirst in a week or a month long trip across the Atlantic. There were also those who argued that there had been an isthmus or a narrow land bridge that had connected both continents, so the animals had crossed through there. But such a narrow isthmus in the middle of the Atlantic wouldn't have lasted long before the sea made it disappear. Others suggested the existence of a chain of islands. The animals could have moved slowly, swimming from island to island. The only problem was that there was no evidence of these islands anywhere. This was the most realistic proposal of all, but it lacked evidence, just like Wegener's idea. So Wegener took the bull by the horns and started researching. For example, he discovered that fossils of the Mesosaurus, a small marine reptile that lived about 280 million years ago, had been found in both South America and Southern Africa. It was a marine animal, so yes, there was a possibility that it had swam across the ocean, 
But a question remained. Why didn't the Mesosaurus spread to a bunch of other areas? Wegener thought that these animals could only live in a specific climate and they should be freshwater animals, so they couldn't swim across the saltwater oceans to live in other areas of the planet. He also discovered fossils of Glossopteris, a large extinct tree that had existed about 250 million years ago. It had large, heavy seeds. It was impossible for the wind to carry them thousands of kilometers away. But things got even more complicated when he discovered that seeds had also been found in Madagascar, India, Antarctica, and Australia. He kept reading and learned that fossils of Sinanathus, large terrestrial animals that had lived about 240 million years ago, had been discovered in both South America and Africa. And that Lystrosaurus, another large terrestrial animal that had lived about 250 million years ago, had been discovered in Africa, Madagascar, India, and Antarctica, exactly like Glossopteris. Sensing the pattern, this brought a question to his mind. What if all of these continents had, at one point, been connected? But how was it possible for plants to grow in Antarctica, which is this frozen wasteland? His brain felt like it was about to explode. <laughs> This fossil evidence clearly showed that about 250 million years ago, South America, Africa, Madagascar, India, Australia, and Antarctica must have been connected in some way, because none of these common species could cross oceans. And even if they could have, the fossils should have been found in other places around the world then as well. The second main piece of evidence was that, since forests can't grow in the South Pole where Antarctica is now, the continent grouping must have occurred in a warmer zone, probably somewhere around Africa is today. He had obtained the biological evidence, but now he needed geological evidence. If the continents had been united in the past, rocks with similar characteristics and ages should be found in all of them. Some great evidence he found was between North America and Europe. He discovered that the Appalachian Mountains, mountains in the north of the British Isles, and the Scandinavian mountains had rocks with similar age and characteristics. This could be explained if, in the past, they were once united as a part of a single large mountain range that connected them, only to separate and move to other parts of the world. He also found evidence that suggested large glaciers had existed in wide areas of South America, Africa, Madagascar, India, and Australia. He was able to date these glacial remains to an age between 350 and 300 million years ago. But how was it possible that glaciers existed in these areas that now have deserts or tropical climates? This observation seemed to make no sense unless there existed such a brutal ice age that practically the entire earth was covered in ice. However, he also discovered that Europe and North America at the same time had an equatorial climate and huge accumulations of coal had been generated in swampy areas with warm climates. These are today's coal basins of Spain, Germany, Poland, and the United States. Once again, the climates of these areas, which today are temperate, did not fit with those from 350 million years ago. So it was strange that there were glaciers in the south of Africa, but not in the equivalent latitude of the northern hemisphere. And it was also strange that regions today that have temperate climates had equatorial climates. Climates follow a north to south logic of going from colder to warmer. It made no sense that there were glaciers where there are now deserts, and that there were warm climates where there are now temperate ones. So Wegener started thinking. This was really a perplexing problem. But he found the solution. He came to the conclusion that if, as he thought, there had been a supercontinent in the southern hemisphere, with South Africa aligned just with the geographical South Pole, it would have explained the Great Glaciers. And the rest of the continents could be located near the equator, so that with this extreme moisture and heat, large deposits of coal could be formed. His theory made sense. The continents had been in different places hundreds of millions of years ago, but he still needed to explain the most important thing, how they had moved. Just at that time, Andrea Mohorovic, 
studying seismic waves had shown that while the outer zone of the crust was rigid and hard, the interior of the Earth was viscous, meaning that the crust was floating on a layer melted at extremely high temperatures. Wegener was able to demonstrate that around 350 million years ago, a great southern supercontinent called Gondwana existed, while another, Laurasia, was in the north. About 100 million years later, Gondwana had moved northward, allowing life to develop in its southern zone, where species such as Glossopterus and Mesosaurus had flourished. Shortly thereafter, Gondwana and Laurasia had merged, forming the supercontinent of Pangaea, which began to break apart around 175 million years ago, eventually forming the current continents. But how did the continents move? Wegener became very excited and supposed that the continents would be more rigid than the ocean floor and could move by breaking it apart like an icebreaker. And what would cause that movement? Well, the attraction of the moon, which just like it causes tides, could cause the displacement of continents. Exultant, he finished his book called The Origin of Continents and Oceans. He thought people would applaud him in the streets and give him a Nobel Prize or something like that. In 1924, his book was translated into English, German, Russian, and Spanish. And then the criticism started pouring in. Almost no one believed him. The truth is that Wegener was right in his observation. Continental drift was real, but he couldn't explain its origin. In reality, the moon didn't have enough force to cause it, nor did the continents just slide over the ocean floor. In 1930, he organized an expedition to Greenland, in which he sought new evidence to demonstrate continental drift. In November, under extremely harsh weather conditions, they began to suffer from a lack of supplies. Wegener and another colleague went out to get more food, but they never returned. They died in the middle of a tremendous polar storm. So, after a lifetime dedicated to demonstrating the movement of the continents, Wegener died forgotten and scorned by the vast majority of scientists who didn't take his work very seriously. And for more than 20 years, his work fell into oblivion. His biggest problem was that he couldn't explain why continental drift occurred. However, at the same time, other geologists such as Andrea Morovich, Benno Gutenberg, or Inga Lehmann were discovering the internal structure of the Earth, a sphere of molten magma. It was not until the 1960s when other geologists were able to explain continental drift by understanding the internal movements of the Earth. Thus, plate tectonics was born, and Wegener was able to regain his place in the history of geology. To learn more about plate tectonics, you might be interested in watching the following video. If you're a high school student and want to watch more geography and history videos, I recommend subscribing to the channel because we have plenty more. And if you're a teacher, you can also find valuable resources for your students here. If you found this video useful, please give it a like and leave a comment. And feel free to share it with anyone you think might be interested. Thank you so much and see you next time.